Hi, this is Phil Newman. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Longevity Technology. And uh, today we're meeting one of the speakers at October's Rejuvenation Startup Summit in Berlin, uh, CEO of Selvi, Dr. Alexander Schiller. Hey, Alex. Hi, Phil. Thank you very much for taking the time to, to learn about myself and uh, our journey at Selvi. Much appreciated. Great. Well, I mean, the things that you're doing are, are fascinating. And uh, uh, you raised back in 2021 five million um, in a deal led by Kazoo Technology Capital. Um, so what progress have you been making since then? No. Okay. Um, yes, indeed. Um, we, we raised it, the money in 2020. Um, and at the time, we, we were still of the, we still had the objective to pursue a product of freshly isolated mitochondria that we would use in conjunction with heart attacks, um, organ transplantation to ameliorate what is called ischemia reperfusion injury. With Kizu's um, investment, we were able to grow far beyond that um, initial, let's say, plan. Um, the primary objective of the seed round has been, on the one hand, to establish off the shelf mitochondria that you can freeze, that you can thaw, and immediately use by um, by the by the physician. Um, the second objective has been to broaden the pipeline. So, in addition to ischemia reperfusion injury, we wanted to establish therapeutic mitochondrial transplantation in other indication areas, so that we can bring it about as a as a platform, as a category of medicines. And we've been working towards that end, um, developing various prototypes for our product, and the front runners of which will be tested in large animal models um, towards the end of this year and early next year. And with regards to the pipeline, we've been able to develop two interesting programs in cell and gene therapy, as well as in aging-related degeneration. That's fascinating. Well, obviously, you mentioned uh, ischemia reperfusion there. Perhaps you could just explain a little bit more about what that is for us. Yeah, of course. I have to admit that the first time I came across this term, it wasn't very clear to me as well. Um, but if you think about the indications that are associated with it, uh, the pattern starts emerging. So medical conditions include heart attacks, strokes, organ transplantation. Basically, whenever the flow of blood is interrupted and subsequently reintroduced, you talk about ischemia reperfusion injury. And ischemia is the lack of oxygen, basically, due to a lack of blood flow, because blood carries oxygen. And reperfusion is the reestablishing of the blood flow, so the reintroduction of the oxygen. What's interesting is that Ischemia and reperfusion both, they both damage the cell. And the reason they do this is that the mitochondria that turn oxygen into energy, they get damaged due to the lack of blood flow, due to that lack of oxygen. And so when oxygen flows freely again, the cells are incapable of processing it. Free radicals form and cells die. And that's why you speak about ischemia and reperfusion injury. So, so, Alex, you mentioned uh, expansion of your pipeline. Now, uh, that demonstrates for me that you're thinking as a platform play, which is very exciting. That's what everybody's looking for at the moment in terms of their investor appetite that's happening in the marketplace. So perhaps you could just expand a little bit more for us on what's happening within your clinical pipeline. Of course. Mitochondria have been tied to many different disease pathologies. And the reason is that they are originately, if you will, very intimately tied to the emergence of complex life. And so they took on in the evolution various roles within the cell. I already mentioned their ability to turn oxygen into energy, with that energy becoming the basis for cellular function. But they also work as chemical power plants. They are, have a very pivotal role to play in inter- and intracellular communication. And so a lot of diseases are unsurprisingly tied to mitochondrial dysfunction. But what has been really difficult is treating these mitochondria. And what my co-founder has shown is that mitochondria transplantation, so introducing healthy, viable mitochondria into distressed cells, allows you to affect that cell energy metabolism to repair and augment the mitochondria that are affected by disease. So naturally, when I looked at this the first time, I thought that is an interesting modality that can be used possibly beyond ischemia reperfusion injury. And so we've been working towards um, a program of cell and gene therapy, as well as a program of aging. So in cell and gene therapy, we like to make use of the mitochondria's ability to lend energy to cells. But also we've shown that you can use mitochondria um, in combination with the gene therapy, wherein essentially the mitochondria become 
carriers of the gene therapy. And secondly, we've been working towards aging, because as one of the nine hallmarks of aging, mitochondria have a pivotal role to play in many degenerative processes. So what we have been looking at is at where in what we know our therapeutic mitochondrial transplantation can do, and the, let's say, aging-related degeneration intersect. And there is specifically in muscle degeneration an interesting play that we believe that we can exploit down the road. Fascinating. So you're going to be moving from um, you know organs to muscles, which sounds which sounds very interesting. So perhaps you could just help us out by understanding um, how therapeutic uh, mitochondrial transfer works. I mean, how does it actually how does it take place? You know, do you yeah. have issues with rejection that type of thing? Just really interested yeah. to know how it actually, how it works together. Uh, so that's a good question, um, Bill. So um, the mitochondrial transplantation we expect will work a little differently depending on the context in which you use it. So in ischemia reperfusion injury, where well, I would say we have the greatest understanding of how the process works, it's a rescue mechanism. So as I alluded to earlier, the ischemic phase, so the lack of oxygen leads to a malfunctioning of the mitochondria. So you can think of an interruption of the cellular um, energy metabolism in those cells. If it's not repaired, the cell will ultimately die. And so what we believe happens with mitochondrial transplantation is that we reestablish the cell energy metabolism. So you can think of it like jump-starting a car. So during the ischemic phase, during a heart attack, for example, the cells get the mitochondria damaged. And that damage leads to will, a stunning of the heart. And it will ultimately lead to a big infarct. Now, what we do is we transplant healthy mitochondria into those ischemia distressed cells. The mitochondria are then taken up by what's called endocytosis. So they're integrated within the um, target organ. And then we've, we've shown that they merge with the mitochondrial network. So they fuse to lend what we believe is energy information and possibly certain signals that allows the cell to reestablish its original function of turning oxygen into energy and thereby survive when it would otherwise die. And so um, I hope that's a, that's a uh, understandable process. So Alex, you mentioned the previously that you're looking at um, both aging pathways as well as target endpoints. And this is something that I believe a lot of organizations are wrestling with in longevity at the moment. Obviously, you need to target um, a disease outcome because you need to prove your regulatory pathway with a view to commercialization. But of course, lots of longevity businesses are looking at the aging drivers that are sitting behind this and understanding how they obviously can in the, in the future become the, the future longevity therapies that we are all working towards. So I'm very interested to understand how you're approaching your, your outcomes, um, how you're mapping your outcomes across different biomarkers, and just trying to understand how you're looking at your, your clinical uh, pathway and how you're looking to prove that. That would be very interesting for us to learn more about that. Of course. Maybe I pick up on one of the points you just mentioned in terms of how do you prove out ultimately that you can affect aging? I mean, the biggest challenge is time, right? So um, especially as that, let's say, time that you need to prove out whether it's a truly, let's say, um, reversing or at least uh, slowing down of aging-related degeneration takes years, whereas venture funding is um, usually, let's say, a target return within eight to 12 years. And for some of the, let's say, aging-related diseases, you need probably a clinical trial of multiple years to prove out that your therapy actually works. And that's why, I mean, that's what a lot of startups are doing in that space, and so are we. We're looking for a front-runner indication, which, let's say, um, is within a more, which has a much more timely endpoint. And that's why our front-runner indication is ischemia reperfusion injury, um, that we believe we can have very straightforward clinical endpoints on, like in heart attack settings, the size of the infarct, the function of the heart thereafter the survival rate of the patients. And that will allow us to take the technology to a very attractive market and make it a profitable business opportunity. And then we want to develop on the longer term, the aging related application. And in this, we are specifically looking at the muscle also because we believe that our ability to functionally assess within a reasonable time frame the therapy success is 
um, let's say, acceptable. Like, so we're looking at muscle mass, we're looking at muscle strength, we're looking at endurance. I mean, those are endpoints that in an animal model you can prove out anyway within a time, time frame. But even within, um, let's say, a human population, um, we hope that we can affect the muscle in a timely manner. In particular, if you think about some patients in rehabilitation, for example, um, but also, um, let's say, uh, really hope that we can reverse some of the degenerative effects. And that is much quicker to prove than, uh, let's say, a slowdown of the aging per se. Yeah. And Alex, would you, would you consider, uh, from a theoretical perspective, when you're looking at your study design, is it possible to, to, to test for both as you go along? For example, when you're looking at your phase one um, healthy patient study for safety and so on, could you be looking at the biomarkers associated with muscle decline, for example, to then use that as an early phase proof point, as opposed to waiting until you've got your approval for your your target endpoint and then starting again. I just it's a theoretical question yeah. that I'm wrestling with yeah. at the moment. I mean, study design is always a balancing act, right? On the one hand, you have the regulatory demands that you need to fulfill. On the other hand, you have the demands of potential investors, potential users, so kind of commercial considerations. And um, what you just pointed out is, I mean, the, the ideal case is that you can, um, let's say, observe multiple endpoints at the same time, possibly even have an adaptive study design where in based on the results that uh, you choose on how long the study would go um, or what else you could measure down the road. Um, but, I mean, um, for us, I think, as a company, the most important initial endpoint is safety, right? And then um, an efficacy endpoint that the FDA will um, allow for an approval. Because the ultimate value inflection point for a company and your ability to pursue your pipeline is to have a product that is marketable. And so we really emphasize quick approval um, in all our clinical study designs. Very good. So let's talk a little bit about Selvi, shall we, before we wrap up. Uh, you guys... As you, as you corrected me, it was uh, two years ago, 2020, um, that you actually raised your round. So um, are you guys raising again soon? What's what's your plans for yeah. expansion in the next phase of your of your growth? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, um, I mean, we have a timeline until 2023, up until which we want to raise, or rather up until which we want to achieve our milestones, which should then enable our Series A race. So we are currently preparing some of the pivotal studies for our off-the-shelf prototypes. We are working towards some of the, let's say, early proof of principle in our pipeline applications. And together, we believe that data pool will be sufficient to raise an attractive Series A. Currently, target timeline is Q1 2023, and we seek to raise likely somewhere between 30 and 40 million, depending a bit on the outcomes of our studies and also how we choose our milestones for the next round. Very good. Well, uh, best of luck, uh, Alex, to you, Thank you and your colleagues. And thanks very much for joining us today. It's been fascinating. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Phil.